in between the first and second conference, this had already been happening before, but there was in that year especially, there seemed to be this growing idea that, uh, what well, to use the slogan from that time, anytime there's a discussion about women's issues, men should just shut up and listen, right? That there's this thing, male privilege, and because of male privilege, you really don't understand women's issues. And if you think you do, you're only just blinding yourself because of this privilege. And I was concerned about that. In particular, the CFI is an organization devoted to free expression, free exchange of ideas. That's how we think we can move forward as a society is that meaningful conversation between people with contrasting viewpoints, perhaps, and no one should be shut out of that discussion. Now, that's not to say that people who have certain experiences that others may not have shouldn't be listened to. It's not the listen part of shut up and listen that I took issue with, right? So obviously, if someone thinks they've experienced sex discrimination, sexual harassment, and wants to talk about that, yeah, you listen to them respectfully, see what they have to say. But that doesn't mean they have a veto policy, veto on any policies that should be designed to deal with that issue, right? Men can, in fact, have meaningful input into those issues. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was something that should be mentioned. So at the opening for this conference, first of all, should be pointed out. And by the way, my speech probably still online because I posted it once the controversy broke. So you can, people can verify this. I spent the first half of the talk uh, addressing the fact, obvious fact, that women had suffered uh, oppression and discrimination through the centuries. I tied that into religious beliefs, et cetera. Uh, I talked about how I was hoping that the conference, by the way, at, at that point, I did welcome everyone to the conference. One of the myths about this conference is I never welcomed the, the women there. It's just false. I didn't welcome them at the beginning because I wanted to hit the ground running because I thought mm -hmm. this conference was important. I want to emphasize how important the conference was. And I, one of the issues I wanted uh, people to address was, you know, the different strands of feminism. Uh, obviously, there's controversy within the feminist movement about the right approach. And I thought this was something the conference should do. And at that point, I did segue to talk about how, well, when we discuss these issues, we should be open to having everyone participate. You know, to right. listen to what women and men have to say. And I, I mentioned how I thought that the concept of privilege could be abused in certain circumstances to essentially exclude men from the conversation. And I thought that was incorrect. I didn't think it was that controversial a topic. I did want to point out, you know, that my belief is strong, still a strongly held belief that this idea that you have to experience something to talk about it meaningfully is just wrong. Well, that set off the controversy almost immediately. Uh, part of the problem was, and this is you know, a quote or a paraphrase, at least from one of the first people who commented and objected to my talk was, well, what's a white man doing introducing the conference, right? It's like I had no business there. I mean, I was the president of the organization. It was my decision to put on the conference, but apparently I had no right to address the and, conference. And don't you love this too? What, what does white have to do with it? Right. It's, I was saying, when I saw that sectors, comment, it's a gender related event. It's not, it has right. nothing to do with race. Right. And I was, when I saw that comment, I was thinking, would it make a difference if I was a black man? I mean, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and after that, it, there was just, it was like everything I had said about uh, the oppression of women and how CFI was committed to ensuring total social and civic equality for women. It's like, I didn't mention that at all. All they heard was that uh, men are being silenced. And then, you know, R Lindsay is contemptuous of women. It just it went on from there. And, you know, the CFI board uh, was flooded with a number of comments from people. And I should say on both sides, there are people who supported me as well. And it actually, you know, one thing I didn't bring out just for this discussion, because actually something in my study I keep as inspiration is a comment that was sent in that I thought this is one of the comments objecting to my talk. And I thought because it was so thoughtful and I think epitomizes the careful analysis that people gave who objected to my, to my speech, I should keep this to remind me of that, you know, careful thought process. So it's from a person, I won't mention it, to the CFI board, subject Ron Lindsay and CFI, quote, former member and former subscriber. I might consider resubscribing and joining if CFI shows that it considers women to be human beings. The continued presence of Ron Lindsay indicates otherwise. So there you have it. I Obviously, the subject of my address was to indicate that women are not human beings. 
despite the fact that we were putting on the Women in Secularism Conference. At any rate, the, the board received a number of comments like that, but I received a number of comments in support. To make a long story short, uh, the board decided to keep me on, uh, which I'm happy they did. Uh, did not, however, I did recommend to the board a certain statement be released. They decided not to. I respect mm -hmm. their decision. In part, the reason was, let's just get this behind us. You know, we, it's, it's a drag yeah. on the rest of our mission, and we, you know, we don't I, want this to be the focus of the rest of the year, which I, I can understand. And when you think that from, a, I guess, a 2013 lens and 2013 perspective yeah. from the culture wars, right, that you would think that once this is behind CFI, once this is behind you, this is not something that's going to be, you know, continuously mentioned, continuously used as a weapon to attack you and your reputation, that from, a, I guess, a standpoint of professionalism, you know, even even from their perspective, oh, maybe you made a mistake, or maybe you said something that that they didn't like, but overall they'll still support CFI, right? You you would think that in a normal course of professional events as an organization, that this is something that you could get past. Yeah. Um, but spoiler alert, that didn't really happen so much. No, no. I mean, it continued to uh, be a point of controversy for some years after. Again, uh, it died down certainly to some extent, uh, but you know that. Unfortunately, that that perception, that belief, mm -hmm. which clearly to me is a, just a very misguided understanding of, of communication uh, and just logically infirm, because if you think, just think, think about this for a moment. I was thinking about this when I was thinking about our discussion uh, this evening. Uh, I mean, it's so obviously wrong, this idea that you have to have experience, lived experience of something to be able to talk about the policy implications of addressing that issue. Just think of any host of examples. How many people, for example, have been tortured? Presumably, I hope, a small minority of humanity. Nonetheless, yeah. we all have clear views about torture. Most of us think it's wrong, certainly as an instrument of policy. Same thing about just about any other issue. How many people have, uh, have been addicted to opiates? Mm -hmm. Again, hopefully not that many people, but we have ideas about what our policy should be in that regard how we should treat addiction, what responsibility companies might have regarding opiate addiction, uh, and to take a more controversial issue, but again, an obvious example, police are being tried for you know their actions they've committed, in some cases, to me, quite properly, because I think they have uh, you know, yeah. abused the position. And you're None not a former us, police officer. I'm not, I'm yeah, not, I'm not a former, former police, police officer. officer. We all, but we all have ideas about how the police should behave and conduct themselves. Yeah. We don't have the lived experience of having to make split second decisions about how to deal with criminals, whatever. But we do have an idea about what the proper behavior of police should be. And I think quite rightly so. I think we have a right to those opinions and we can discuss policy implications. I certainly don't have a problem with people who argue that we should defund the police. I think they're very mistaken in that belief. I think it's counterproductive. But yes. for their, I certainly believe in their right to say that, even though they don't have the experience of having worked as a police officer. 